documentary is a live inquiry into things. It's not a communication strategy. It's not thinking of a message and then finding a way to deliver that message. So you have to be responsive to the world that you encounter and to the things that happen during your shoot. You can't be formulaic about the way you use that kind of document. You have to be responsive to what you're finding. I started out as a community artist, so I think the thing that which sort of took me into film in the first place, and this is like in the early 80s when sort of Channel 4 was just starting up and there was this kind of workshop movement which was about trying to broaden access to television. Uh, and I found that very inspiring, I guess, that it sort of fitted with my politics and I kind of, so, so in a way that's how I came into media stuff. And then for the next 15 years I did, did sort of basically community-based media, working with people to tell their own stories on film. And, and I think that feeds in quite a lot into the documentary work. What I've asked Jerry to talk about today, partly because this talk is partly aimed at people doing the short documentary module and the documentary MA, is about the development of the project, uh, the Greenpeace film that I, I know most people here have seen, How to Change the World, a wonderful film about the origins of the Greenpeace group and movement. Um, so he's going to talk a little bit about that and also about how he distributed it. What I was going to do was sort of take you in a way through the process of that film, both from a, a creative point of view and also from the sort of, you know, the kind of the, the, the producing side, I suppose. So the, the um, uh, raising of money, the kind of getting of access, the, the rights to, in that film particularly, archive, and then the distribution of the film. Um, it's kind of... I mean, I suppose because it's a, an archival film, pretty much, I mean, I think 70% of the film is archive footage, it's a little different from, from uh, say, uh, shooting an observational documentary and how you make work around that. And I'll talk a little bit about, about other films I've done which are more on the other model and try and sort of bring those, those two into it. Lizzie's said a bit about the, the films I've done. These are a very quick summary. Uh, I've just finished yesterday, in fact, um, the next one, which is called Sour Grapes. It's about um, a guy who um, started faking extremely expensive um, vintage wine during the finance boom at the turn of the millennium and, and selling it to people who were becoming kind of newly wealthy through, through that finance boom. Um, I think he put about 100 and <coughs> $130 million worth of wine. Uh, into the if it had been genuine into the into the wine industry and that's launching at hot docs on tuesday so we've taken the completion of it right to the wire i thought i'd just start just thinking about ideas um and where ideas come from i mean these films are a real range of topics you know from sort of environmental movements to two girls in an Ethiopian village who want to be athletes to a guy who lives in a camper van who was a sperm donor 30 years ago and his family, his biological family, are coming to find him to a disabled punk band to a round the world seller. So they're really different in, in topic. And I suppose part of the thing is when I finish a film, I sort of feel like I really want to do something else. Uh, and that's maybe the way of doing it. But they probably all have a slightly common approach. You know, they're all feature docs. I seem to be quite wedded to the form of a feature doc. I love the kind of, the, the, the way that duration of sort of 85 to 100 minutes can enable you to create something quite complicated and layered. And, and usually it's shown in settings where people give it a lot of attention. I think, you know, they sort of sit down and they commit to the film, which means you can make something that's a little more, um, sort of subtled and complicated, I suppose, and, 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 and I, I, so I, I love that form, even though it may be a, a dying form, possibly, I don't know, maybe I need to, <laughs> to, I'm getting quite into virtual reality, actually, so I think that's probably the similar, similar sort of form in a way. Um, so yeah, so they have that in common, um, and, you know, they're, they're, um, they're, they're funded in, in a number of different ways, but so, but I suppose for me, you know, I do, I do feel like you can kind of make a film about anything. There's this great quote by Nicolas Philibert who made Etre Avoir, which is a fantastic film, a uh, French film about a rural village school, and I recommend it to anyone who hasn't seen it. Um, and he said, uh, I don't care about the subject, the subject is totally secondary. You can make, I think, a great film with a very tiny subject. I'm convinced you can make films in the next cafe because in the next cafe there are men and women and stories and all of life. Um, it's a question of a way of looking at reality more than the subject which is important to me. Um, and I think that's like often we come to thinking about films and we think I'm going to make a film about sperm donation or something like that or I'm going to make a film about uh, Greenpeace even. 
Um, and I, I guess that's, that's sort of, I think that there's a problem there in the, that a subject matter isn't the same thing as a film. A film is something quite distinctive and contained uh, and specific. Uh, so often the way ideas come to me are not really in terms of a subject matter. It's not like, oh, I'm really interested in that. Let's try and find something that's an example of that. So for example, the, the film about the sperm donor, it wasn't a case of saying, I'd, I'm really interested in donor conception. I want to explore that issue. It was, we, we just got a call from a guy who lived on Venice Beach in a camper van who told us that he'd uh, donated sperm 20 years ago and that children were coming to find him. So, and so it's, you know, obviously that film does explore donor conception, but it also explores a whole set of other things about kind of what a father is, what biology means, uh, um, and the specifics of their own, their own relationships. Um, so in the case of the Greenpeace film, uh, I happened to be in the Institute of Social History in Amsterdam, uh, which is a great kind of museum of, I guess, kind of social movements in Europe uh, over the last century. And they have a film archive, and I was doing some research on something else there, and there was a guy in the corner sort of on an old 16 millimeter film get spooling through these incredible um, images uh, of, of 1970s kind of hippies in boats. Um, and I got talking to him and he'd been given a job. It, it was very fortunate. Greenpeace had just at that point decided to um, centralize all of their archive uh, from around the offices around the world, old film cans that had been sitting on boats for years and used in public screenings and send them all to the Institute of Social History who were gonna store them. And this guy had been given the job of deciding what to keep and what to throw away. And he had, he had a year to go through 1,500 cans of, of material. Um, and I was going, no, I don't, don't show, throw any of it away, you know, because he would get things like, you know, you'd open a can and you'd see things like this, you know. So this is, there's 1,500 of these cans, but then within those cans, there's hundreds of little spools of rushes that someone's shot, you know, and this may last only a couple of minutes um, and in another corner of the room there are two suitcases full of quarter inch real tape and you know somehow that, that those, those suitcases may have the sound that links to this picture because they recorded separate picture and sound but how you get into matching that is a massive process and most organisations of course are just going to look at that job and say no way are we going to invest the resources to do that, um, well let's just chuck it. I think the, the next thing, so I'd, I could remember from my childhood in the 70s, you know, seeing that, that shot of the harpoon sailing over the heads of Greenpeace uh, campaigners. And I don't think it meant actually that much to me at the time. You know, it's a time when punk was kind of coming through in Britain and I associated um, Greenpeace with sort of prog, prog rock albums and my sisters who are all older than me making me play um, bongo drums to the hair musicals and stuff like that so so I was not very into Greenpeace um, but um, I guess Greenpeace is this enormous force in the world and uh, something everyone's heard of and I was just very interested in the idea that that had started from a really small group of people from sort of 12 hippies in a boat and had very very quickly within the space of a couple of years become this this international organization and i was uh, you know i've spent a lot of time in my life in kind of collective organizations of various kinds and film collectives and housing collectives and, and i'm interested in the dynamics of what happens when people try and do things in a non-hierarchical way and what are the strengths of that because um, in some ways it's fundamental you know we all inhabit institutions or, or or units or family units that try and do that and what are the kind of weaknesses of it and how do, what, are the, or what, are the, what are the dilemmas it faces and the dead ends. Uh, and Greenpeace seemed a great example to explore that. Um, so I started reading the books of Robert Hunter who was the first president of Greenpeace who if you've seen the film is sort of the central character in it and he, he's, he writes these, the, he's wrote 13 books not all about Greenpeace but often mentioning his time in Greenpeace and he writes about it very kind of unpresidentially, very sort of poetically and comically and uh, um, you know, with a lot of self-doubt and self-criticism, and I really liked the tone of those, and I sort of felt, okay, what I want is that f the film is essentially about, you know, about his sort of struggle to kind of lead in a way that he, as, as in a kind of non-leaderish sort of way, and how, where does that take him? And I wanted to use the, the writings in the book as, as the sort of narrative voice in the film, because Bob had died in 2005, and I only got onto this in sort of 2007. Um, so the next step really was to start talking to the people involved um, 
I kind of made contact with most of them. They were all of an age where they really wanted to, um, I think, uh, explore this, this bit of their lives that had been so significant in, in really the whole trajectory of their lives since then. And so they were pretty much all, all happy to, to take part. Um, the, so, so I guess sort of when, when I'm sort of thinking about, so at this early stage of an idea, you know, we've got no money. Um, at this stage, I wasn't part of the staff of Met, so we're kind of, everything you're doing is sort of for free. Uh, and you're thinking, well, is this story, you know, what are the strengths and weaknesses of this story? Uh, you know, a weakness, actually, I think, uh, both the strength and the weakness is that it's about Greenpeace. You know, in one sense, everyone's heard of Greenpeace, that's great. In another sense, everyone's heard about Greenpeace and kind of doesn't want to hear any more, especially if they feel that Greenpeace is kind of going to be, the, you know, going to be telling them it. Um, so I knew from the start it was pretty important that the film was independent of Greenpeace. Um, so we weren't going to get funding from Greenpeace, there wasn't going to be any editorial control, and luckily I had an ar the, the archivist in, in Greenpeace International was really supportive of the project. He'd seen films I'd done before, he sort of trusted how I was going to do it, um, and he kind of helped me navigate the hierarchy to license this footage. So we licensed it, and the deal was we would also s create a digital scan of it, so preserve it for the future, and I basically scanned everything in the period uh, in which I was interested in, which was really the period of Bob Hunter's leadership of Greenpeace, so 1971 to 78, 79. Um, I guess sort of in, in thinking about stories, you know, I'm trying to find stories that are, that have like a number of levels in them, you know, th that where there's, there's sort of, you know, there's tension at three levels of the story. Um, you know, one is the kind of personal level, you know, what's going on inside people's heads. Uh, another, the interpersonal level, what's going on between people, and the other is the social level, which is sort of what's kind of causing this, and how does this interact with, it, with the world and, and society. And it feels to me that you need, you know, if you only stay at the interpersonal level, for example, you're kind of in the territory of Made in Chelsea. Uh, and if you only, you know, I don't know what happens if you only stay inside the heads of characters. That's probably a really interesting film. But, um, but for me, you know, creating that kind of layer is really important. Um, and in this, I suppose I was interested in, you know, how people conceive this thing themselves and, and, and what their motivations were and whether their motivations were, you know, people have, have explicit motivations, the things they talk about, and then they have unconscious motivations. And in this case, you know, there are motivations about power and ego and things which are often contradictory to the things that they say. And that's an area that in this particular story I was kind of interested in. Um, obviously, it has a lot of interpersonal stuff going on, but it also has the kind of wider social uh, um, conditions of that time, I suppose, which were, you know, the, 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 the kind of advent of, of new media, a particular kind of historical moment in Vancouver, and particularly when uh, this sort of hippie movement kind of merged with this anti-Vietnam War movement and, and where there was the beginning of a, a sort of consciousness of ecology. Uh, and all of those things I thought were kind of really relevant for our time now. You know, it's not 16 mil film now, but certainly the internet has transformed our relationships, obviously, and, and also the way in which we communicate about the things that are important and about issues and the way political groups have taken that up. So I thought it had a lot to sort of speak about, about, about now. And then I guess with the story, your next kind of stage really is to, you know, I love this quote from Walter Murch, who says the director is the film's immune system. And I think the reason I like it is it feels like it takes a lot of pressure off. Uh, it feels like that your job as a, as a director is not to kind of have ideas, but to stop ideas <laughs> kind of coming into the film. And that, you know, like, like an immune system, you're sort of protecting the, 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 the health of the, the singularity of this story and this project. Um, Often, you know, when you're developing a film, people say, oh, you know, well, I want a really clear vision of what the film is. And that's OK, but it's often hard to put into words. And often it's easier to say what it's not <laughs> than what it is. And I think that's OK. Um, because the other thing that happens when you're developing a film is that everyone you take it to will throw in ideas uh, and possibilities. And there's a tendency, I think, especially when you're um, kind of an emerging filmmaker to sort of take on board all of those and if you do all of that you'll you'll destroy the sort of unity of the film you'll destroy the film
so I guess the first stage I, I, in all of these will be to start to get try and get funding and take it out take the idea out to um, people who will possibly finance the film um, and the classic way of doing that and it still really kind of works I think as a way of doing it is to create a kind of three and a half three three and a half minute four minute what well, you know I think people call a teaser rather than the trailer but uh, and a kind of pitch that might be like a five minute verbal pitch that goes with that and a sort of document uh, which may be three or four pages long um, and those are your sort of basic tools uh, and, and a sense of how much it's going to cost I suppose and how long it's going to take and those are your basic tools really um, and the difficulty you often have in developing is how do I fundraise to even do that you know because I think your, your three minute teaser it can't just be like three minutes of an interview with someone really fascinating it has to actually play I think like a film you know it has to you know, both show the world that you're going into, show those, how those tensions are going to play out in that world, have the potential, you know, have an obvious potential for story, have a scale to it and visually show what you're going to do. It's no good showing a trailer and say, yeah, well, I'm actually not going to shoot it like that. I'm going to do this. You've, it's got to look really in a way what the, what the film looks like, because partly because people are so, partly because so many great films are being made at the moment, and it's really hard to make your your film kind of rise above the sheer number of fantastic documentary proposals there are. And partly because the people on the other side, given that situation, don't have to do the work to understand what's going on in your head. You know, they want to see that you're able to to turn it into something external, a short film or a, or a pitch. So, so often you'll try, we'll try and raise that funding to do that bit off maybe non-film funds. So with Donor Unknown, uh, we went to the Wellcome Trust who are interested in images of uh, me or media that, that um, enhances debate about biomedical science, social and ethical issues in biomedical science. Now you wouldn't necessarily think donor, you know, a, a sperm donor living in a camper van was kind of ideal territory for that. But actually the issue of donor conception is a massive social and ethical issue and one that, you know, government bodies are looking at and drawing up regulation on so there is actually a kind of strong theme there and they gave us funding to go and do that initial trailer and there are other people who will do that kind of thing there's um, uh, Worldview which used to be part of the De Department for International Development will, will used to support you which is basically about supporting kind of images of the rest of the world in Britain um, they will often support a, a, a trailer or you can try and make your film as a short pitch your film as like a short film to people like the New York Times or Guardian, Vid, Guardian Films who will fund, you know, five minute films. So there may be like a smaller film within your film that you could, could just get you going, get you into those relationships. Um, in this case, we did go to film funds. We went to the BFI because um, we thought this film's quite, this film's going to be quite a, a big film. Um, so we went to the BFI and after I think probably two applications, they gave us some money, which I went away and did some research interviews. So uh, just some interviews with um, the contributors. I did some very rough digitizations of, the, of some of the archive because um, that was going to cost 15 grand and we hadn't started doing that yet. A number of, of pitching events at mainly at documentary festivals around the world. So, you know, Sheffield Documentary Festival, there are maybe three or four different pitching events in that. There's a pitching event, I think Wellcome Trust actually has a pitching event for ideas around biomedical science or uh, there's, I think there's like a student pitch. I think there's, um, you know, there's lots of different pitches and basically the format of those pitches is you have about seven minutes, you show your three minute trailer, you speak for uh, a while and then there's a panel, you speak for five minutes or four minutes and then there's a panel who will kind of, um, offer you sort of advice there's usually a kind of prize but more importantly there are people who might fund the film in the room and if you go into those pitches knowing who those people are even before you're in the pitch you need to sort of set up meeting you need to have flagged up what it is and set up meetings with them because they're often very busy but there are there are pitches like that around you know, there's one at hot docs in toronto there's a big one at idfa in in amsterdam in november uh, the sheffield then there are sort of kind of smaller ones like uh, Docs Barcelona, there's one, there's one in, uh, in, in France, there's one in Prague. So there's lots of, you know, depending really on what the, the base of your film is, 
you, 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 know, you need to find the right place to pitch it. Um, and those pitches are, are competitive just to get into. So usually you have to submit like a one minute piece uh, in, order to, in order to progress to the next stage. And then the next stage is either this kind of Dragon's Den style thing, or it's a sort of speed dating thing where you spend two days one-on-one -on -one meetings with, one-on-one 20-minute -on -one meetings with, with possible funders of the film. Um, so this is what we did for How to Change the World. I mean, I guess this isn't the very first one we made, um, which was probably rougher, but uh, this was the... September 1971. The boys are still returning from Southeast Asia in body bags. Richard Nixon is on speed in the White House. Some 56,000 nuclear warheads are ready to be fired, and they're planning to test an even bigger bomb in Alaska. If you aren't paranoid, you're crazy. Vancouver at that time was chock a block with hippies from everywhere across Canada and the States. Bushy head to bare toed sandal with draft dodgers. We were part of a small group of friends. Bob Hunter, my husband, was the heartbeat of the hippie movement. These are the people who will shape the next 10 years of my life. It was becoming more evident that there was big trouble coming. And what were we going to do about it? The idea? We sail a boat up to Alaska and park it right next to the bomb test. Between us, we have almost no practical experience of the sea. We're sailing into a nuclear bomb. And the drugs, you know, definitely help. Alaskan Thunderfuck was the brand that got you stoned. That you would just sit there and you'd just smiling, and a bird could land on your head and, and crap on it, and you wouldn't move. <laughs> That's bizarre. Groovy, man. <laughs> that whole journey changed everybody's life. Returning from Anchitka, I'm convinced we've lost. But we came home to pretty much a hero's welcome. And then when Nixon canceled the tests, well, we won. The movement had begun. We have people here from all over the world who can speak a bunch of different languages. And one of the languages we're learning to speak here is whale. Greenpeace stood for a little guy can do something. Yeah. The birth and the creation of Greenpeace well, was bigger than we ever imagined. We were also all consumed in getting there that we had really forgotten what getting there was going to do to our lives. There was all this backstabbing and backroom dealing and betrayals. Was this going to end up just being a generic word, this word Greenpeace, or was it actually an organization that had a center to it and some directors? We were battling constantly, and even today, even this moment. You know, Patrick is, um, is everything I detest. You see this for him? That's when it all came out. I haven't lost a hair since that was over. For those of you who've seen the film will recognise there's some lines from there that's in the film, but the interviews are all like pre-interview research interviews. Um, I guess what was important to try and get into that was, you know, first of all, you know, people are going to come with an expectation of what the film is, and in a way the first half of that trailer is that expectation, this kind of celebratory film about Greenpeace, and then the second half is to say, you know, this is kind of much richer than that. It's kind of going sort of under the surface of that, and we're going to get into you know, their relationships with each other and what that meant for the organisation and the difficulty of taking a movement into something that was a kind of practical organisation. Um, so, so, I, so I suppose the trailer tries to lay the themes out. It tries to sort of, you know, it's really useful if it can kind of get people emotionally and there's things about that trailer that are emotional. Um, you know, obviously I don't care at this stage about music rights or, you know, we're just using it in a private environment to, sh to show people. Um, I'll show you just to, by comparison the, the sort of finished trailer of the film. So this is the one Picture House made. 
The Atomic Energy Commission now receives the requisite authority to go ahead, including detonation. The protest ship, the Greenpeace, is heading for Amjitka, hoping to anchor offshore and stop the test. There was definitely an unfinished feeling after Amjitka. Bob felt that there needed to be an ecology movement on the same scale as the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the peace movement. I just said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to save the whales. <laughs> whales? Whales? I thought he was just nuts. Expecting any violence on the part of the whalers? Um... <laughs> Bob coined the term mind bomb for what today we would call going viral, where an idea gets into the electronic media and just spreads like ripples on a water instantly. Battle lines are drawn again between conservationists and government officials. Harpooning a whale is not really a story, but people risking their lives to protect the lives of a whale, that's a story. George Crouch and Bob Hunter are in the Zodiac. We have to get between the whale and the harpoon. That's the image we have to get. They just shot the harpoon. Did you get that, Roy? That was the moment that launched the modern environmental movement. Suddenly, we became celebrities. They got bigger and bigger. Did the members of Greenpeace campaign any contribution? The weakest link was always going to be ourselves. Our goal was not to make the organization famous. Our goal was to make nature famous. When you're under fire, you don't have time for debating. You just have to act. They're for very different purposes. You know, that one's kind of much more impressionistic. Um, and wouldn't, I don't think, work as a fundraising trailer in quite the same way, maybe, because I think you need to kind of, it's a little too impressionistic, probably, for, for that. In terms of how to change the world, we uh, were funded by, um, I guess, quite relatively few funders uh, for the films that I've made. Often we'll have 10, 20 different funders uh, on a film. Um, how to Change the World was funded by the BFI in the end. Once we'd got BFI funding, uh, Sky Atlantic came on board uh, and took UK rights. Um, and then uh, the film was a co-production. You know, it was obvious to try and make the film a co-production with Canada because we, we needed to shoot in Canada. Uh, it's a Canadian story. Um, so we formed a partnership with this uh, Canadian production company, Insight, who kind of do like Canadian, uh, often sort of, um, you know, what's the word, reality formats, um, like Intervention and uh, Amazing Race, which is one where people chase around the world. So feature docs were not their thing. Um, but the, the, um, the, one of the sort of directors of that, of that uh, company had been involved in, in Greenpeace very early on. So had a kind of, or had, I think it helped them fly helicopters uh, or something. So had a, had a sort of personal connection. And they, they were fantastic. I mean, it was great for us, for this tiny company where there's just two of us doing docs, um, to then have the weight of this huge operation behind organising stuff. I mean, that was a kind of eye-opener for me about how smoothly a shoot can go, you know, because, because they were really sorted on it. Um, but th so so, so that, that would bring in Canadian finance, which would essentially fund the Canadian elements of it, which was about a third of the budget. Um, and then the final piece of funding was a was a sort of private investment fund that's in the US called Impact Partners, who who bring in sort of people that are interested in particular subject matter to fund feature docs. Um, and all of each one of those was a sort of pitch process. We would go to a meeting, we'd show the trailer, we'd have our little chat, which was getting kind of better and better as time went by. I mean, I should say the first the first thing we did with this was um, take it through something called Discovery Campus, which I think. I'm not sure if it's still called Discovery Campus, but it's a, a European program which helps um, people develop feature documentary ideas in, with European partners. And it's like it happens, you, you go on like four one week training events which, involve, which culminate in a pitch at Leipzig Film Festival. So, and, and essentially those four weeks are all about, uh, there's lots of teaching and learning, but there's also endless pitching so by the end of that year you know you have something pretty in fact you have a pitch that's so great that it's way different from what the film will actually be you know and the difficult you start pitching this thing and you think how the hell are we ever going to make that you know um how am i doing on okay uh yeah so 
and just to talk about the way that that those that sort of funding pattern works i mean i, I won't show it to you for, for um how to change the world uh, but you know a typical example would be say donor unknown it's you know when you're when you're funding a film essentially what you're giving people in return for funding is some sort of right over the film and that might be the broadcast rights uh, or it might be satellite or cable rights or it might be catch-up tv rights or video on demand rights or streaming so that would be kind of or, or streaming and download rights or dvd rights or theatrical rights or educational screenings non-theatrical screenings all of those are different kinds of rights that essentially essentially you can hang on to or you can sell and uh that and and, and i suppose you would call that kind of the, the different media that the film was in uh, and then, of course, you've got different territories. So, so for each territory, um, those rights are available. So that might typically be how you would put together the funding of a film. That might take a couple of years, you know, of these pitches, um, during which time you're making the film. You know, we're just getting on and trying to make the film anyway. Um, so, and the deal will be, so for example, more for, um, so they had broadcast rights, they had two years worth of broadcast rights. Then we, we were allowed to, to, to postpone their broadcast till after we'd had a cinema release. So that was the sort of terms of that deal. And they didn't have any of these other rights, which is kind of interesting. So that we could then do stuff with the DVD. We could sell it on Vimeo. Uh, we could do a theatrical release, which we did do. Um, and, but they took the telly. And obviously once it's, once it's gone out on telly, all of those other things are less valuable. So ideally you want them to come before. The Typically for feature docs this process is like a two three year process so you've got to be doing more than one film at a time. Usually I'm doing three films at a time. Usually I kind of argue for like I think Don't Run Known I think we cut in 12 or 14 weeks maybe but usually I try and argue for an edit that's like 18 20 weeks um, and people go people that are producing for television where you're doing your tv one hour usually in 10 10 weeks maybe, I always think that sounds like a crazy schedule, but I do think that um, A, editing is relatively cheap, it's just me and an editor in, in their bedroom, and it's, its contribution to the quality of the film and the story is hu huge, you know, if you run out of time on the edit, you know, that's why you end up with poor films, I think. Um, and so now, usually I try and build in a, um, a kind of pickup moment in the edit. So in the last two films, in Has Changed the World and Sour Grapes, We've ended up doing a one, two day shoot, um, which has sort of been scheduled in maybe three weeks from the end of the edit. And that's been about exactly that. You know, it would be great if this person, you know, especially if it's interview based. I mean, obviously, if it's a kind of observational doc, you can't really do that. Um, but if it's interview based, there might be a portion of an interview where, you know, they just need to say that in a slightly different way for it to really play. Um, and that, that's, you know, that, that's when I would go back and, and shoot, yeah. And what, what we tend to find though is that, you know, once you're in an edit, you, you know, you make good with what you have. And, and those where you might start an edit feeling like, oh yeah, we need this, this, this and this, you know, as time goes by in that edit, gradually those things fall away and you find other, other solutions for those problems. Do you have like a don't get your hair cut rule with your um, interviewees until the edit's finished? Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I kind of... The, I mean, usually the, the, the last two films have had a lot of sit down interviews in, you know, the, in the Greenpeace film and in Sour Grapes. Prior to that, I would try to sort of avoid um, sit down interviews. So I'd usually be, be interviewing people within a setting, a situation within a scene, rather than as a kind of, okay, let's sit down. And it's mainly because those two stories are both retrospective stories. They're about things that have happened in the past that you need people to remember. Um, I think, fortunately, people <laughs> didn't have a lot of hair, so, so that was okay. But I do sometimes, you know, I send them a photo of what they were wearing in the previous interview and say, you know, can you, can you come as this, yeah. For example, we had a bunch of interviews of Bob Hunter um, that were done in, you know, 2000, and 2000, say, you know, and were, they were good interviews, him talking about history of Greenpeace. So there's an option to use that. Um, but my feeling was that that would undermine something kind of fundamental about the film, which is that you can't, that you were they were either now or they were then, and they were they weren't in the middle bit. And also that that sense in the film that he's in a way you're hearing this slightly disembodied from beyond the grave thing. I just felt that it would be it would be 
there's, there was something, that's where the director is the film's immune system thing, because people obviously go, well, what, you got these interviews with Bob Hunter, why don't you use those, that's great. Um, but of course, that's where you've got to make decisions about what's the narrative voice in the film. And if he's both, if he's both this voice, this narrator, and he's in interview, immediately you're in a, like a weird third person, first person thing. So I felt like you had to, you had to, we just had to disregard all that stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just talk briefly about rights in that, I think is a kind of good thing to do. So this is one scene from How to Change the World, and uh, this is a participatory exercise. As we play this, have a think about all the different rights you need to secure uh, for this scene. When we were almost back to Vancouver, they announced November the 4th was the day for the bomb. This afternoon, on hearing that the Atomic Energy Commission will proceed with the Amchitka test, crew members said that President Nixon has clearly circumvented all legal procedure in sanctioning the blast. On Amchitka, the last workers are hustled away from the test site into a concrete bunker 20 miles away. And the chair of the Atomic Energy Commission plans a family picnic. I will be on the island during the test. I did bring along two of the girls and my wife. I think that that should indicate the high degree of confidence that we have in the safety of that test. As a neighbor to a person who is doing something potentially dangerous, I might call the cops. Uh, yes, well, there are no cops to call. Tell me what rights do you think we needed to get for that clip in various bits of it. What about the, the newspaper caricatures? So the caricature, which is here, so this they absolutely have rights in and the cartoonist has rights in and you know very fortunately you know there was a little signature for it somewhere and we googled and we found this 93 year old guy in Canada somewhere <laughs> who had drawn this cartoon. So the newspaper in that case couldn't couldn't release the cartoon because the rights were still, you know, the, whatever their deal was, with the, he was a freelancer and maybe he allowed it to be used just in the paper for that day, but they didn't have rights to sell it into a film. So we had to go back to him for his rights. We, we did a rights deal with, with him around his cartoon. Luckily, he was contactable. Otherwise, you have to you get into this area of, you know, you've used your best endeavours to get this thing and you're able to, you, you know, you do a deal if people come forward later. And the problem with that, obviously, is that they've kind of got you over a barrel, really, in terms of cost, because you've made the film. And to undo that is, is a huge, hugely difficult thing to do. So do you sometimes just kind of be really nonchalant and sort of like, yeah, we might use your cartoon, we might not, you know, try and get it for like 50p? <laughs> in this case, we go, we go, you know, yeah, we love your cartoon, we love to use it. Can, you know, would you accept X? Yeah. Uh, often, yeah. I mean, those are, yeah, those are always negotiations. And music, so the other one, you know, or any, you know, the other one is music. I mean, in this, it's composed music. So we've paid a composer, we've paid to record that music. And as part of that, we own the rights. She actually owns the soundtrack rights. So I think she's put it on iTunes as a soundtrack, but, but this is the, we own the rights for the film. But if you used a piece of recorded music, obviously you've got the publishing rights and the musician's rights, the composer's rights. Um, and, you know, those, that's, you know, the stuff we've just negotiated for sour grapes. It's around about, often averages around like $5,000 either side of the, you know, for publishing and things. So th those kind of tracks cost a lot of money. Um, again, I mean, so you, I overheard you talking about audio networks, which is just, you know, astonishingly good resource for, for people in terms of how cheap 
what is pretty good music, I think, now. And you've got some of the biggest kind of composers in the world, like Debbie Wiseman, putting their material on audio networks. It's, I think, represents a bit of a threat to composers because you can license music for a whole film for 200 quid or 83p, I think, a track if you're a student. But um, it's, it's an incredible resource. And, and I think the lesson I'm learning is to be really wary about what you temper film up with because you tend to sort of, when in the edit, you use kind of stuff that you couldn't possibly get the rights to and then you really tie your picture and, and you, you tie it in your head to that and then you can't get it and then nothing works as well. You know, a lot of the footage of the atomic bomb, the atomic test going off, was owned by the US Atomic Energy Authority. Um, and that was shot by the atomic, for, as, for an information film about it. Um, and that's actually public domain. So that's free. Um, but you have to, if you don't want to take the, f you know, 480 pixel thing off YouTube, which is going to look pretty rubbish in your feature doc, you need to find the source of that. So we were desperately looking for a good print of the, of the uh, film that the Atomic Energy Authority made. And our archive researcher, who's the best in the world, um, Elizabeth Klink, uh, found it in a library in Alaska, public library in Alaska. And so we managed to ship that to Toronto, get it scanned at, at kind of 2K HD resolution. And so a lot of the footage comes from, from that. Um, but, and obviously the cost of that is quite substantial, um, but, the, uh, but the actual rights in it are free. So that, that included this stuff, the helicopter stuff. Uh, this bit with him is news. So this, yeah, that's news been lovely to have held that shot a little longer but he starts speaking on that very frame uh, that's news um, with all of this material we you know on the whole archives as archives go digital the quality of what they hold of, of old archive is kind of gets worse and worse um, and partly because I think the film expertise is going from archives, you know, the people that really understood 16 millimeter film and the fact that, you know, your, your print may not be the same as your kind of reversal, your rushes, you know, and that somewhere there might be a, a, the, the, the original print, which maybe had never been screened, but just used to make other prints. And that's going to be the one that doesn't have the dust and the scratches on it because it hasn't been through a projector. Um, so we would always try, and this was true for Greenpeace as well, we would always try and go back. We sort of made a thing of trying to go back to the negative of the film. And the reason for that will become apparent when you see this. So this is some footage that was in Greenpeace, where the first thing we came across was a print. And then we dug and dug and dug until we found the negative. And the difference is, is just incredible, really. This is, um, this is the print that we found. You know, it's a color. It's actually a color piece of footage, but, you know, it's time and light and exposure to heat has leached all the color out it's gone red it's got these long scratches this is the original original um neg that was shot pretty clean no dust if the lights are off you'd see it's incredibly crisp and, and the colors are all there so when you compare those two things it's uh, there's an astonishing difference and you know that's the one that tries to sort of keep you in the cinematic world and make the thing feel present tense that one just feels like this is something that happened a long time ago and it's less immediate and that kind of decision, that research is really important for the, the style of the film. Yeah. We spend the whole time trying to make our digital stuff look. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, you do, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's tons, I mean, I do use a lot of those plugins and stuff as well. In fact, we use that whole, the whole, you know, fucked up film thing in the, in the, as a sort of motif in the, in the film and we use it kind of in some of the animations as well to try and to try in some ways that's about bridging it over in some ways it's also trying to say something about you know this is a world of analog media and to try and kind of really make that something you're conscious of when you're watching the film and how different you know how the fact that they you know to organize things they didn't have a facebook group they had to do it with a phone tree where they phone the next two people down on the tree and then they phone the next two people and that's how they got together demonstrations and meetings. The other one is the, the rights in the writings. So, you know, we culled the, the narrative voice in the film from lots of different sources of Bob's writings um, and sort of recrafted them a bit as well. Not, you know, not substantially, but sometimes we'd take a sentence from one book and a sentence from another book and put them side by side. Um, and so that involved getting quote rights from different books. Um, and actually we got the full rights on one of his books, the one that's the most detailed one about Greenpeace. 
uh, and then the actor involved. We were looking for an actor who kind of, whose voice, because occasionally we were cutting from the narrative voice, the writing's voice to the real Bob, we needed a voice that was reasonably close. So you kind of kept that identification and, and um, we worked with Barry Pepper, who's a kind of, you know, kind of Hollywood actor, but from, uh, from actually from the near where Bob Hunter's from uh, in uh, Manitoba, I think. And, um, you, you know, just was able to, you know, I sent him lots and lots of voice examples to try and push his voice kind of, you know, whilst it's a very different kind of voice, it's much more intimate and personal in the way we've done it, but to try and push it, you know, as close as we could to Bob's voice. And, and, and Barry did a fantastic job on that. It's a very kind of intimate, emotional voice. And very different from the one we were working with, with the edit, which was a much more sort of declamatory. He's got some good lines. There's that yeah. line where he says, it's stuck with me since watching the film. For every mystic, we had, had for, uh, yeah, for every mystic, we had at least one well, mystic. Yeah. It's part of, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the books are just full. He just has fantastic kind of one-liners. Um, and that's why in the end, those rules that are in the film that sort of segment the film and segment it over time, we sort of pulled those from those kind of one-liners in, in his books. Um, but the, the, yeah, the, the sort of mystics and the mechanics idea was kind of pretty crucial to Bob's theory of management, if you could call it that, which is that, you know, that he wanted this team that could, uh, that on the one hand, could, could kind of make engines work and, um, and kind of, you know, repair Zodiacs and, and sail boats and at the other uh, people who could, you know, I think uh, people like Walrus who, you know, in order to find the story that isn't in the film is Walrus. <laughs> trying to find the whale. So there's lots of mystical stories about how they found the whales. You know, one is the, well, one is the mechanic story, which is, yeah, we just listened on the radio and then we heard the Russian voices and we, you know, headed towards that area. And then there's the one that's in the film, which is the I Ching, which Bob used uh, at various moments. But there are two others. One is, was that um, uh, Mel, who was the hippiest of all the hippies on the boat, was left in charge of the the boat overnight steering the boat and it so happened that there was this incredible full moon that night and he'd been given a very strict course by John Cormack who was the captain of the boat to follow whilst everyone else was asleep on when he was on his four hour watch but instead of following that he just started following the moon and when the moon set and the sun rose you know there was a Soviet whaling fleet right <laughs> Uh, and then the other one, which, which I think only Walrus sticks to, is that um, you know they were having real problems. Uh, oh no, this was during the encounter. Walrus <laughs> apparently stripped off, who who is a sort of shaman, stripped off naked, covered himself blue, and called the whales from the front of the boat. And because the Russian boats were faster than the Greenpeace boat, they were kind of getting away. But what Walrus did was call the whales towards the Greenpeace boat, so that the encounter. <laughs> So, you know, those, those skills are useful in uh, all movements, I think. But, yeah. I, I guess in that scenario there, because there's, that, there's the lovely scene which you do have in there about the I Ching. Yeah. And you, you couch the whole kind of, you know, what potentially more than all the audiences would see it as a bit of kind of hippie hokum. Yeah. You couch it by having the personal accounting story being, um, I can't remember. Uh, yeah, she's, she's a skeptic. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like the skeptic, yeah. If the skeptic talks about it and then she's kind of drawn yeah, into it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. it does prove to sort of Yeah, work. yeah. So you have the I Ching one in it, but then you, you so you leave out the... There was the, just such the, a... The others, because I guess yeah, if you're given time, you can't... Yeah, you and you have to you have to find one thing that stands for the other things. I think, and and yeah, there's that danger of just storytelling wise of just having repeat beats, you know. And I and I suppose especially in a film like this where everyone's got these fantastic anecdotes about what happened. I think the real thing you have to be wary of is just that the anecdotal, you know. And yeah, in in itself it's funny, but in terms of how it works in the film, it just traps you in a little loop around a, re a repetitive beat. So this was the uh, this was the one we rejected. Um, so we actually did get as far as, as, as rough cutting it, and then in the end we stuck with the I Ching story. Here we were last night. Yeah. And get those signals again and try again. Eventually signals are getting stronger and stronger, so we knew we were getting closer and closer <coughs> to them. Till mystics took over <laughs> and, and claimed the victory. <laughs> There were people on that boat, like Mel Gregory, that was a mystic, through and through and through. And he was reliably unreliable when it came to dealing with the physical world of reality. 
<laughs> Cormac would give them a course. And when you're hunting an area of the ocean, you set up a grid pattern. And you run a leg, and then you run another leg, so you can tell where you've searched, right? I don't think Mel thought that was a very good idea. And there was a nice moon, and the moon travels across the sky, and Mel decided to follow the sky. Stoned out of his mind, following the glow of the full moon, <laughs> runs into the Russian whaling fleet. <laughs> and that's mystical. <laughs> I suppose maybe this is a moment to talk just about how, you know, content-wise, how how I kind of work with a story like that. You know, I tend to uh, think in terms of scenes. Um, so if it's an observational film, um, you know, I'll have a sense. I guess the thing that first draws you to an idea for a film is its shape. You know, you have a rough sense of the shape of the film. You know, where its highs and lows are. Or, or if the thing hasn't happened, where its highs and lows might be. Um, and then as I do that early research, I'm starting to sort of fill that in and thinking, well, there might be this kind of scene and there might be that kind of scene. You know, so in Donor Unknown, well, maybe he'll meet one of the kids and maybe we can shoot that. And, and I'll build that up into a, a sort of scene structure. And then I'll start shooting. And at the end of each day's shoot, I will kind of just write a paragraph of... Uh, what I think I've shot as a scene. I'll write them on the day of shooting, in the evening, whilst, whilst I'm copying the rushes down, and I'll try and write them almost as though it's a film, a fiction film script. Try and write it in as sort of dynamic a way as possible. You know, imagine it. So, you know, at the set, I'll imagine, you know, okay, the sound of girls singing, you know, she's having a game of football, the girls complete a song, and da da da, you know, and I'll try and write it in that way. Uh, and I think the value of that, there's various sort of values of that. One is whilst you're writing that, you realise what you've left out or what you need in order to make that scene really play in an edit. So, for example, you know, I might shoot a scene and I might think, OK, you know, this person... Uh, in this scene, for example, yeah, I was with Howie, these two friends, and they hadn't seen each other for a year. And so I'm immediately thinking, OK, I need to go and talk to the other friend who's 400 miles away and when I talk to her, I need to also play that, ask those questions about missing her friend, you know. So it'll immediately start to give you ideas about what you need to shoot in order for this to play. And the other sort of use of it, I think, is that when you come into the edit, you know, often I'll have 100, 150 hours of footage and I won't be sitting down with the editor for four weeks and watching that end to end because it will just suck away the time. So I'll be using these scenes as a kind of <coughs> as a guide to what's in there and a guide to what we're going to cut um, and what the scenes do is tell me what I the, the feeling of what I saw when I was shooting it um, and I'll do the same in an archival film as well so when I watch the rushes I'll be doing exactly the same thing as though I'd shot it myself live I'll be writing thing writing scenes in a sort of um, scripty kind of way uh, of the things that I'm seeing and those scenes will ultimately build up, you know, gradually over time. And as I, as I shoot, I'll be amending this all the time. So by treatment eight, uh, and I'll, I'll color green everything that I think I've shot, and I'll color red stuff that I still need to shoot. Um, so as I'm getting towards the end of the shoot, uh, those scenes are starting to be, you know, some of them be chucked out, but I'm arranging them into a pattern of, of you know, 30 scenes, the, th the 30 scenes that really function as the, as the film and I'll be chucking out the, the the ones that don't work or I'll be merging scenes but gradually I'll be building up this thing and green will be stuff I've shot and red is stuff I still need to shoot and gradually the thing will turn more and more green and then I'll, <laughs> I'll decide okay now I can stop shooting and then uh, we'll get into the edit and we'll get into the edit with these paragraphs so we know okay today we're going to work on this scene and all of it uh, and here's the footage you know and I'll create a timeline for the editor of that footage which is maybe a 15, 20 minute, half hour timeline of the material that relates to that scene. And if there are particular cuts in that that I know and remember work from when I was shooting them, I'll do, I'll do those cuts, you know. So sometimes I'll give him things which are quite edited and sometimes things that are just very rough. And then I tend to, you know, at the moment I'm working a lot with Jim Scott, a brilliant editor in Brighton. I'll often kind of, I guess the broad pattern of our week might be that he would be on his own for three or even four days a week and I will be coming in at various times showing him through those scenes and the paragraphs and talking about how I think the scene should play. He'll do a first cut, then we'll swap it. 
etc. And, and then in the last final sort of five, six weeks of the edit, maybe we'll, once we've got a rough cut in place, we'll be working together all the time. Let's have a look at this. So before I shoot, I might have this that I did for the funders, okay? Um, and this might have, you know, a summary which has the beginnings of what the shape of the film is. But it might be, it's completely fictional in the, in the sense that, um, you know, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm sort of putting what might happen. And actually, it's amazing how much, when you really get into researching something and you think about what might happen, how much what might happen actually does happen. So as I start shooting, I know I'll be sort of looking for things that are around that pattern. And then I suppose the further the shoot goes, the more specific my shooting is to that pattern. It's the way of keeping hold of just tons of material in the digital world. You know, how, how do you, you know, you can't just shoot 100 hours and then go into an edit and work out what you're going to do with it, I think. You've got to have a pretty strong, if you're shooting that amount of material, you've got to have a pretty strong sense of what the shape of the film is and how, it's, how, how those things work. Um, this great quote from Joris Evans, who's the sort of great Dutch documentary maker of the 30s and 40s, you know, saying so also there's a clash between material and concept that occurs during the first days of filming. And what you do with this clash is crucial. Your engagement with reality rather than adherence to a concept, a preconceived idea. And I think that's really true. You know, if doc documentary is a kind of live inquiry into things, it's, the, you, you, you know, it's, not, it's not a communication strategy. It's not thinking of a message and, and then finding a way to deliver that message. It's an inquiry in itself. The activity is a, is a process of inquiry. And so you have to be responsive to the world that you encounter and to the things that happen during, during your shoot. So that, you know, you can't be formulaic about the way you use that kind of document. You have to be responsive to what's, what, what you're finding. Before I started the shoot of Greenpeace, now Greenpeace, the, the How Changed World is a film about, um, uh, you know, it's a film of, of stuff that happened in the past. And, uh, you know, I could have done, I did my research interviews and I'd read Bob's book. So I had a sense of what the scene structure was actually before we did the interviews. Uh, and before I knew what was in the archive as well. Uh, so I was kind of starting to look for archive that might help around these scenes. So this, this was one scene example in uh, How to Change the World, which really covers everything from when they set out to sea to when they find the whales, uh, or when they're just about to find the whales. The next scene is the, they find the whales. Um, before I was looking into the archive, it includes you know, characters that aren't in the film anymore. Tusi Spong wasn't in the film, although I did talk to her. Um, as we started to edit and look at the material, you know, that started to uh, escalate. <laughs> so scene 16 turned into like scene 16 A, B, C, D. I think it actually went up to F. And then it started to get into, you know, scene D1 and D2, you know, because I was finding events that were very well covered in the in the archive because basically they'd had time to waste they had this 60 millimeter gear they didn't know if they were going to find whales they didn't really know what film they were making so they just shot stuff and within that stuff there were all these great scenes you know there was the I Ching one there was uh, the whole mystics and mechanics thing there was hearing the Russian voices you know so that 1616 expands out and then when you're cutting you know I try and work, organize the material in a sort of bins way so I'll, I'll, I've got had 40 hours of interviews and I'm starting to split the interviews down into that scene structure uh, create timelines around each person is, is this too sorry I'm rabbiting away so, um, so you know so I might take Myra McDonald's interview or Rex Weiler's interview and I'll take out I'll, I'll have it transcribed but I'll, I'll create a timeline out of each individual's uh, interview relating to these scenes and then they start to escalate even more because in the interview they, they say even more stuff so it expands <laughs> even more and these were, this was our folder structure for, for what had been scene 16 in the treatment this is this is probably this is this is like the exceptional one where they don't all go like this but just there was something about the way they shot material in Greenpeace that made this happen um, and then we kind of made a decision okay well each we wouldn't there's a real danger that you, I think, treat your contributors, uh, especially if you're working off transcripts, um, which I don't think is a good idea, which is why I make these timelines. Uh, we, we sort of felt that if you have large numbers of contributors, it's better to kind of keep each scene held by one or two contributors. And that goes back to that, uh, that question of, you know, why tell the hippie story from the person who's the least hippie-ish? Well, that's the kind of just that creates that 
that sort of tension around it, I suppose. Um, and so you're thinking about who's best placed to tell this scene, to lead on it narratively, if it's, if it's quite an interview-led, interview-ish sort of film. So we'll end up you know, with, a, yeah, with a scene structure like that, and each of those will have a sort of paragraph around what that scene's trying to do. So, in the, so this was about the fact that they were running out of food and money, which I think has, in the film comes down to just one thing that Rod Marining says. Um, but you know, this was all the archival footage that we could use around that. Uh, um, this was selects from different people talking about that particular moment when basically they, I think they had a, an incident where their rice supply got polluted with fuel. And uh, you know, there was a question about, should I include that incident in the film? And, and that's where, you know, there was shots of fuel covered rice. And, but, but, you know, in the end, that whole scene came down to one line. And in the end, on something like that, our timeline looks like this. That's the film. When we were getting near to the delivery of the film, one of the things we did was just to track lay the edit uh, so that it made it easy to account for the material we'd used to the different rights holders. So bottom line here is, is kind of visual interviews. I think this is footage from, this must be footage from Greenpeace because most of it was focused in the central area. The, this is news footage and other, other sources. And then that's kind of, you know, photos and, and things like that. Well, is it, it's helpful actually to have somebody to say to you, is it not, this film has got to be 58 minutes? Some, yeah, sometimes. I mean, I mean, usually I am, Had Changed the World, there's no other versions, there's just that version. Other, most of the other films I've made, there are 58, 52. One, one was an 85 minute film that there's a 44 minute version of. That just misses out whole chunks of the film. Um, I think the, and it, so it is, yeah, it is useful because it helps you make those ruthless decisions. And often I find that once the best time to do that is maybe three months after you've finished the edit and you've shown it to people and you've sat through it and you're you start to hate aspects of it and that and you can kind of slash and burn with no it's an enjoyable process to slash and burn your own film whereas in the last week of the edit it feels like everything that's there is absolutely essential and you know you'll fight for the tiniest little thing um whereas a bit later it's it's easier but the, but the sort of feedback process i mean there's the that process with funders and then I'll also do I'll try and do screenings you know with a projector and show it big, big with an audience and usually I'll try and do three or four of those in the last three weeks of the edit three four weeks of the edit I think the thing of the thing about feedback is that people will often try and offer you solutions and I think it's important not to get waylaid into the solution you know they'll say oh you got to cut that or you got to do this or you got to and it's important just to hold on to the fact that you probably know how the film works best um, and the you're probably the best person to find the solutions but you have to listen to what the problem is that they're speaking to so it's like you know oh you need to cut that well okay so what's the issue there is it that, that you're in a p part of the film where the plot is starting to pull or you know why why is that thing not working for you and really trying to understand you know it might be that that's essential for the film but it's just not working so so the best you know it's to try and interpret everything everyone says and try and find what the problems are that they're finding in it or the things they don't sometimes those can be really simple or sometimes they can be problems that are actually way earlier in the film um you know that the problem with that scene is something that's happening way back here and it might be something even that you've had in the film so you think that's working and then you cut it and you've forgotten you've cut it and actually that doesn't make sense anymore in quite the same way. So it's just trying to listen only to, to the problems and trying not to, uh, you know, sometimes you'll get notes from commissioning editors which are quite precise things they want you to do and usually I'll ignore, <laughs> usually I'll ignore that. Uh, no, usually I'll just try and think to it through it in terms of what the issues are because otherwise you just get really angry you go cut that that's really stupid that's the best bit of the film you know <laughs> and but actually if you start thinking about okay why are they thinking that what's the what's the thing that's making them think that and usually that will you know usually there is some reason as to why that's there and and uh, so i think i think it's essential to do those screenings during an edit because in an edit you're very tight on, on the micro and almost the most useful thing I find is, is sitting, is just what's going through your head when you're watching the film with an audience, because it feels really different. Can you say a little bit about distribution maybe, okay. about the distribution of the Greenpeace film? Yeah, so, so I suppose in the funding process, you've, you've got kind of certain timing boundaries around the film. Uh, 
you know that Netflix are going to want to show it on January the 1st, I think, and we'd finished it in March. So you knew that we had sort of seven months really before. And once it's on Netflix, it's really hard to sell the film because it's all over the world and people can get it from Netflix. I mean, well, actually, it's proved that there are lots of other little windows that, that, that work. But, um, and so you, you're kind of starting to plan a release strategy which basically goes in phases. You know, it'll have big festivals first and then there might be some broadcasters and then there might be a DVD release. And still it pretty much follows that pattern, although the windows that used to be quite fixed between those events now are getting much more compressed, which is a good thing because otherwise you have to do a kind of new publicity strategy every time you do something new. Um, so for us with How to Change the World, um, we submitted to Sundance on a rough cut. You know, usually the Sundance, Sundance makes its decisions around about November and you submit, I think, the end of August. Um, and so we got into Sundance. So that's, that's a fantastic kind of starting place for the film. I suppose there are three or four festivals mostly North American festivals because that's the biggest market where it's it's if you can get your film into them it gives it a massive start and you know, that would be kind of Sundance and if you can't do Sundance then it's kind of South by Southwest or Tribeca or you know Hot Docs in Canada um, or um, you know I guess I guess Cannes or, or in, the, in, in Europe um, but sort of three or four festivals then it's a process of sort of, you know, you, the, the things you have to keep an eye out for are where are you doing your, you know, they, they have different kinds of premieres now and festivals are really keen to be able to call it a premiere. They have your world premiere, which is the first time you show it. You have your international premiere. I never can't understand the difference between the international premiere, but apparently something can be an international. It's shown in your own time. Exactly. Although weirdly, at Sour Grapes at Dockfest is an international premiere, even though it's shown as a world premiere at Hot Dogs. I don't know how that works, but anyway, <laughs> there is something called the international premiere. And then there's like the European premiere or the, you know, the Argentinian premiere or the Ukrainian premiere or whatever. And those are important to festivals to be the first people to show it in their country. So you're trying to get the biggest festival in that country to, to do that. Um, would you would you hang on? I mean, or do you try and time your to finish your films? shortly before well lots nowadays there is a cycle where lots of people are trying to you know have their production cycle around trying to hit Sundance and I mean for this one we just couldn't do that because we just come off has changed the world so it didn't work um, um, or so so yeah so you're kind of juggling that if you get it into one of those big festivals in a sense a lot of your work's done for you I don't think we submitted has changed the world to any other festivals other than Sundance maybe I'm exaggerating. What happened was that as soon as it was on at Sundance, lots of festivals approached us. And so it's been in, you know, I don't know, 100 festivals, 50 to 100 festivals. Um, but pretty much that's been requests. And that's great because you don't have to pay the entrance fee. Um, so, you know, all those 50 quid entrance fees, you know, it saves a lot of, a lot of money. Um, if not, you've got to be selective about what your budget is to submit and you use something like Without a Box. But the danger of that is just that your film gets a bit lost in, you know, the, often the pre-screening process for festivals is like interns going through stuff and saying, okay, well, you know, this one was good. Now you, your film might just miss that. So it's really helpful to try and make sure the festival knows about the film in some way and, uh, and kind of is expecting it um, and, uh, you know, has a heads up about it. Um, so then once you've done your sort of festival strategy, uh, you have to kind of think about when you're going to release on DVD and VOD uh, and usually that needs to be after the broadcast of the film or at the same time as um, and often those are you know the broadcast will often be constrained by when their slot is so so with the current film Sour Grapes it's on Arte in September I think uh, or October maybe um, which means that you know in France and Germany nothing can really happen until until that in terms of DVD and online, but we could do a theatrical release uh, before that if that happened. But yeah, any other? So that so, I mean, there are people that will help you with that. There are organisations that, um, you know, there's also the, the the question of screening fees in festivals. Um, you know, usually, if it's a feature doc, it's fair to ask for a screening fee. Um, and there are organisations that will do that for you for, say, 50% of the screening fees and will, do, will manage your festival strategy and take 50% of the screening fees. So, you know, if it's a strong enough film and they take it, that's quite a good way of cutting down on, on your work. 
Um, and, and again, I mean, the other thing about distribution is often you're, you've got to balance self-distribution against the amount of work that's saved by using a distributor. And obviously a distributor will take a big chunk of the money um, that's involved, but it'll save you maybe a year <laughs> of time. So, uh, you know, if you can find, you know, most of our films are distributed by Dogworth um, and they're a documentary distributor that, you know, knows that market and is able to get those films out in that way. And usually we'll try and get them interested before the film's complete. Uh, so with, in fact, with, ha with the BFI funding, you have to have a distributor attached to get BFI funding. So. There's another sort of observation, which I've sort of been thinking as it's a sort of film. Usually when you've got um, a feature dog, which involves a lot of hippies kind of getting into their old age, reflecting back at the past, it's a band, you know, and the film does play like yeah. it's a music documentary. Mm. You know, almost to the extent that Everything that Greenpeace do from the beginning is almost like you know the sort of the great first EP, the kind yeah. of the difficult second yeah. album, the kind of the uh, the seal uh, hunters yes. and everything, yeah. you know, and it kind of and it, but even the, the way in which you do the interviews is similar to kind of like how those kind of old musicians are interviewing the sort of setup and everything. We're, there was a, often in in pitching the film. Uh, I would pitch them as as like you know it's like a band, like, especially their moment of success is a you know was like a kind of band having a hit single and suddenly you know power, profit and money and ego comes into play and they in fact describe it themselves like that. Um, I, I wasn't consciously trying to mimic a rock doc. Uh, I mean, in terms of how we the interview settings, I mean, I I kind of knew that I wanted them to come out of the same sort of space um, and 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 I wanted to uh, an opportunity to do interviews that had time and were sort of a bit had a bit of intensity to them so we we had this we created this studio flat you know set a set which we could basically maneuver and into lots of different combinations and dress slightly differently so it feels like they're all in some kind of expansive wooden hut somewhere um, and we interviewed them over three a three week period and I tried to do three interviews or two to three interviews depending on how significant they were in the film um, always broken by a night so that uh, both me and them would have time to think about what they'd said and deepen it the next day. And usually the better stuff was always on the second day because then they, they kind of understood what the, the terms of it were. And I think things like those logistics add a lot to a film, you know, because they're, you know, that's, that's how you get the kind of, I don't know, if you want a particular intensity or you want a, a kind of emotion to it, for example, you know, I would play them. I decided not to play them the footage because I felt that would sort of over prompt their memories. They'd start describing the footage, but I played them audio. There's lot, there were lots of these long audio recordings of them on the boat messing around and stuff. So at times, you know, in the breaks between interviews, I would just, when they were still sitting in the chair and we were resetting the lights or something, I'd just stick on this audio. Uh, and in fact, what you see at the end of the film when they're all sort of sitting there and you're hearing Bob's voice is, is them all listening to the audio of them on the boat. And often they hadn't heard that ever. They'd never heard that audio. So it was kind of a very weird thing for them, I suppose, to be suddenly taken to that place. But it, I think it meant that their interviews were more kind of detailed and immediate and, and richer. Yeah. And culturally, it's just, it's, it's so rich in terms of everything you've got in there going on. It is like kind of just a missing piece of the puzzle from that point in cultural history, really. Yeah. You know, and it's, it may, did make me think, um, you know, how many documentaries like that that kind of achieve the same um, way of encapsulating it uh, are left to be able to make, you know, just, in, I mean, just because I'm very interested in archive material as well. Yeah, I mean, the, I think it's unusual to find an archive like that where people have hang on to, hung on to the rushes that they shot, you know, rather than just be working with cut films that people have already used in a certain kind of way, which really limits your options, I think. Uh, so that's unusual. Uh, so archives with rushes. And obviously, you know, that era, you know, so if that had happened in the 80s, the material would have been shitty VHS. Uh, but instead it's HD, which you can get pretty much an HD quality. Uh, sorry, it's, instead it's 16 millimeter, which you can get pretty much an HD quality out of. Um, and it, you know, and that, that makes a lot of difference, I think. So it's kind of, the, the, yeah, that period has an amazing, but you know, I guess there. I, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of conscious of like, I was conscious when we were developing the film because it developed over seven years. That you know, in the period that we were developing it, they were going from their 
60s into their 70s or their 70s into their 80s and there was a danger you know some of them did some of the people did die during that process and you kind of lost an element that and there's this other film I'm developing at the moment where I was just thinking the other day yeah you know you have to get on and do that quickly because as soon as the people as soon as the people aren't there anymore how do you access that the detail of that sort of first hand of experience you know it's yeah and I, and I tend to find, I think it's always much harder. It's harder to make a film about the First World War or something now, you know. How do you, how do, you do that? Or, or even harder to make a film about like 1840s or something. And how, you, to make a documentary about the 1840s, you've got to end up like sort of BBC Two with a presenter and reenactments. There's no, and there's something, yeah. So, so for me, it's like, yeah, it's got to be in the age of, of film. How much are you, or at all, are you thinking in terms of dramatic storytelling techniques? Are you thinking in character arcs? Are you thinking in subplots? Mm. You... I mean, I think one of the joys of documentary is you don't have to resolve in quite the same way. You don't. In fact, it's better. If, I think it's better if documentaries leave an audience needing to make the resolution after the film themselves than than to resolve things within the film. I, but I do. I do think in terms of, it, when I'm thinking about that shape, I think I think in terms of act structure. And I do think in terms of the character, yeah, I do. I do try and, oh, there's a guy, um, Robert Smith at Goldsmiths, who teaches on the fiction, teaches a narrative on the fiction course in Goldsmiths. And I think in, in all of the films, except for the most recent one, I've done a sort of one day session with him fairly early on when I'm doing that scene structure where he'll just ask me, you know, we'll sit in a room with lots of little bits of paper and I'll be writing down either the ideas of what might happen or what I have, or maybe I've shot a little bit and I've got some of those things. And we'll just be, we'll just talk through the narrative of the film and lots comes out of that, you know, so in Donor Unknown, I don't think I appreciated how this idea of fathering was at the centre of the film and the donor hadn't had had a really bad and abusive relationship with his own father and that had made him not want to become a father and then there were these people claiming a biological kinship with him, but it wasn't about them looking for a father. And, and so there was suddenly this whole layer in the film that really came out of thinking about it much with someone who comes from a fiction background and therefore hasn't got any of the baggage I have about history, accuracy, you know, those sorts of things. But it's, ha it's okay to think of it in terms of themes. I, so yes, I do, I do do that. And I do think in terms of this is the first act uh, and you know, and I think sometimes that can be really limiting. And you, you know, in the end, I think I decided the Greenpeace film was a was seven acts instead of three, or you know, but, but and I started researching seven act structures. But it, it's useful to make you. I think sometimes you just you just you know you just want to look at your material in lots of different ways, and that's one way of looking at it. And and sometimes if you look at it in that way, it'll throw up something that you realise isn't is is a problem or an issue that that you need to resolve. You know, or this character disappears for this chunk of the film what you know what's going on there or you know uh, so it is think you know i think documentaries are you know the the joy of them is that they kind of refer to reality and they're this improvisation between you and reality but they're also this process of sort of co-creation of something that represents that reality that that's also a film and is a construct is something highly constructed you know and i don't have a problem with that that thing yeah yeah you know, it's always a bunch of stuff like with the wine film that i've just done you know one of the contributors who's really like into the, the or, or you know really knows about wine labels and played a big role in uncovering this fraud because of the details of the labels you know i think he for example would like to see much more detail of that in the film but there's also there's my sense of like actually i think that you know you need one one that will represent that one thing that will say what was going on with the labels and why you can tell a label is fake and then if people really want to understand the details of a particular, you know, let's make a website or let's, let's, or Google it, you know, yeah. It's that there's things which should be within that world of the film and things that it, you should be happy just to leave outside. And it doesn't mean they're not important, it just means they're not part of the trigger that the film is. Okay, well, thank you very Great. much, Jerry. Okay. That was so right. useful.